Hello everyone! Our lesson for today is about the science of marine microbiology. Microorganisms are important components of the marine ecosystems. In this lesson, you'll understand what microbiology is and what organisms are considered as microorganisms. You will also learn the different groups of marine microorganisms and their various habitats. At the end of this lesson, you will be able to define marine microbiology, define microorganisms, identify groups that make up marine microbial life, describe marine microbial habitats, and identify the roles of microbes in the marine environment. Before we go to our discussion proper, let me ask you this motivation question. Do you think it is important to study marine microbiology? So at the end of this lesson, I hope that you will be able to answer this motivation question. Now we know that microbiology is a branch of science, so it is a scientific field. But what is science? So we know that science is, is, a, is a systematized body of knowledge based on factual evidence. And the word science comes from the Latin word scientia, meaning to know. So I know that you have already taken this one up in your previous courses. Now microbiology is the science that studies microorganisms. But what are microorganisms? So microorganisms, or we call MLs, or microbes, they could be called as that, are organisms that are too small to be seen by the unaided eye. So when you say unaided eye, now these are eyes no, without anything that helps it see. So say for example, me, I have my eyeglasses, so my eyes are actually aided. No? So uh, without these uh, glasses, a magnifying glass or contact lens, now if you cannot see those, any organism that you cannot see with your just naked eye, then we, uh, we consider those organisms as microorganisms. So with the definition of microbiology and microorganisms, we could now define what is marine microbiology. So marine microbiology is the study of microorganisms that are found in the marine environment. Now the field of microbiology revolves around two interconnected themes. First, is the understanding of the living world of microscopic organisms, and second is the application of the understanding no, of the microbial life processes for the benefit of humankind and planet Earth. <coughs> so where does microbiology belong? So microbiology could be a basic no, microbiology, a basic biological uh, field. So because this is because microbiology uses and develops tools for probing the fundamental process of life. <coughs> Many of the microorganisms are actually used as model organisms or systems not to to study physiological processes within their group. So say for example, the, the microorganism E. coli is a model system for studying uh, bacterial physiology or, or bacterial genetics or, or bacterial morphology. So using one a species to, not to do something about a group of organisms is what we call you know, using the model system and this is very important no? to understand the basic principles, the basic, you know, basic uh, to, to, to gain basic knowledge of a particular group of organism. And, use, and we use that knowledge 
in order to make something out of it, make our lives better. No? So microbiology is, could also be considered an applied biological science because microbiology is at the center of many important aspects of human and veterinary medicine, agriculture, and in industries. So for example, many microorganisms are absolutely essential to soil fertility and domestic animal welfare. So researchers nowadays explore the use of microorganisms to improve the soil fertility, to improve the digestion and, and the nutrient absorption you know, by the lives, different livestock. Also, because of our understanding of the different physiology of microorganisms, then they have been used in cheese making, in wine making, in production of medicine and drugs. Now, so, because of the previous basic understanding, you can use that basic understanding to apply you know, something that would benefit you know, the humankind. Now, microorganisms, we study microorganisms as a whole, and they are very important because they may be the smallest forms of life, but in terms of the biomass contribution, they are actually, you no, know, they constitute a bulk of biomass on Earth. They also carry out many necessary chemical reactions for higher organisms, you know, like the microbial symbionts and many ruminants that help them in the digestion of cellulose. In the evolution of oxygen, we know that the evolution of oxygen was very uh, important for the for the existence of so as or for the evolution of the different animals you no know, and other uh, and other heterotrophic organisms on earth and lastly humans plants and animals are intimately tied to microbial activities for the recycling of key nutrients and for degrading organic matter now in classifying life or microorganisms, we still follow you know, the uh, the one that is being used generally for all organisms. So we know that the that the broadest category classifying life is domain. Then domains are further divided into different kingdoms, kingdoms into different phyla, phyla into different classes, classes into different orders, orders into different families, families into different genera and different genera into different species. Now, when you classify a particular organism, you give them a name. No? So the name, uh, we will, the name is usually consists of a genus name and a specific epithet, which we will talk now later. So the species name would be you know, the scientific name that is given to a particular organism okay so say for example uh the species escherichia coli how is it categorized so escherichia coli or the e coli is under domain bacteria under phylum proteobacteria class gamma proteobacteria order enterobacteriales family enterobacteriaceae genus escherichia and species escherichia coli so you don't say that the species name is coli or cole because that is the specific epithet. The species name is Escherichia coli. The genus name is Escherichia. Now just like when you classify humans, what is this, what is the species of human? What species of human are you? So we are Homo sapiens. No, not sapiens because the sapiens is just the specific epithet. Okay, so I hope that clarifies things. Okay. So we've said that the earth, the domain is the broadest category classifying life. So we know that, I know that we have discussed this in your previous courses, now that there are three domains of life. So the domain archaea, domain bacteria, and the domain eukarya. So both archaeans and bacteria are the prokaryotic organisms you know, with prokaryotic cells. Well, the domain eukarya is the only domain with organisms having eukaryotic cells and what are eukaryotes we know that eukaryotes are those or eukaryotic cells now these are the cells that have distinct nucleus 
Now, archaea are different from bacteria because archaea are only found no, in environment with extreme conditions. So usually, these are very hot, very acidic, or very salty environment. Well, in contrast, no, the bacteria are widespread in nature. You can find them everywhere, so they are ubiquitous. The domain eukarya are those that are composed of the protists, the fungi, the plants, and the animals. So how was this three-domain system established? So we are already familiar with Carl Woos who studied the methanogens. So he studied the 16S RNA of this uh, particular prokaryote and he found out that if you compare them to other bacteria, it has really different pattern. And so he established the three domain system so because before methanogens are classified as bacteria but now they have a different domain already that is domain archaea now in naming organisms uh, the system you know, that is used for naming organisms is called uh, nomenclature and is established by carolus linnaeus in 1735 so the system is called a binomial system that means binomial meaning two so a particular organism is given two names and the two names is called the scientific name that is the universal name given to a particular species now the language used is latin because we know that latin is a dead language it does not evolve already so your understanding if you refer to a particular organism with that with that scientific name then all of the people would understand because they have the same meaning okay so say for example the genus uh the Escherichia coli so the genus name is Escherichia, and the specific epithet na is the coli now when you write the scientific name i know that you already know this but i, I am reviewing it now, so when you, when you write it it should be uh underline no when written it is handwritten the the line under the genus and the specific epithet should not no be continuous they should be separated but when you con computerize the or or you type re or, or yeah when you when it is computerized then you have it in italics now when you are writing report when you already mentioned it once the end of a particular paragraph then the succeeding when you mention it again you don't need to uh, mention the whole uh, scientific name but you can just abbreviate no, the genus name then followed by the specific epithet so in naming microorganisms now even scientific names for microorganisms can among other things describe an organism it they could honor a researcher or identify the habitat of a particular species for example the the species staphylococcus aureus so this is a, a bacterium that is commonly found in human skin so the staphylo meaning uh it refers to the arrangement of the cells cocos it refers to the shape of the cells which we will learn in the next module and the aureus now is uh, means that it has a golden color when it is grown in the particular culture media thus staphylococcus aureus no. escherichia coli on the other hand no, it was named no, from theodore escherich no? so escherichia and coli to remind us that it's actually found in the colon nor in our intestine so microorganisms uh uh, marine microorganisms are actually you no know, constitute of the is composed you no know, of different organisms as long as they are very small and you cannot see them with your aided eyes then they're considered uh microorganisms so in the marine environment there are microbial you no know, bacteria archaea and even you no know, microbial eukarya so maulang ba to sila no mga mga archaea bacteria and eukarya lang ba now in the marine environments also you will also find no viruses so viruses no, are non-cellular entities meaning they are not made up of cells 
but they are of great importance in the marine ecosystems. So the viral particles, specifically we call them avirion. Avirion is an extracellular infectious viral particle. Now do not worry because we will have a separate module for this now that we will talk about marine viruses. So in general, viruses have capsid, you know, which is made up of protein, and inside are the viral genome that is either composed of DNA or RNA, not both. Okay? So they infect living cells and they take over the whole cellular machinery in order to replicate. And that's where sickness no happens when they hijack your particular cell the cell itself the host cell or the infected cell will not be able to function properly now it was believed that viruses could have evolved you no know, as obligate parasites of bacteria you know, because if you analyze them the virus genome often contains sequences that are equivalent to specific sequences in the host cell but actually it could be uh it could be the other way around because now we know that there are CRISPR sequences in some bacterial genes. You know, because when when cells, in, this serves as an, an immune response you know, for some of the cells. Because some cells, when they are infected by a particular, by the particular virus, they would uh, attack the virus and they will insert something from that virus sequence into their own genome. You know, these, are, these sequences are called the CRISPR. So that when they are infected again by the same type you know, of uh, virus, then they will be able to identify the virus and will uh, launch their own attack to kill the virus. So in a way, it is a form of an immune response you know, for particular types of cells. So this could be another way around. You know. Now, viruses exist for every major group of cellular organisms like bacteria, archaea, fungi, protists, plants and animals but at present we have knowledge that only a tiny proportion of the viruses infecting marine life but perhaps it is a better uh, topic no, for a particular research in the future so recognition of the abundance and diversity of marine viruses and the role that they play in biogeochemical cycles and the control of diversity in marine microbial communities has been one of the most important discoveries of recent years so microbes you no know, because we, not, we we are not really considering you no know, um, viruses as microorganisms so if you fair if you refer to all those microscopic uh, entities in the particular environment then you you must refer them as it's best to refer them as microbes you no know, to to really include the viruses no and not just microorganisms so microbes so that means the microorganisms as well as the viruses and some subviral particles they have exceptional diversity and ability to occupy every conceivable habitat for life no conceivable because any all the habit all the types of habitat that you can think of okay so bacteria and archaea have shaped the subsequent development of life on earth ever since their first appearance this is because the metabolic processes that they carry out in the transformation of elements no? in the recycling in the degradation of organic matter recycling of nutrients play a central role in innumerable activities that affect the support and maintenance of all other forms of life Microbial life and the earth have evolved together, and the activities of microbes have affected the physical and geochemical properties of the planet. So they are the driving forces that is responsible for major planetary processes like changes in the composition of the atmosphere, ocean, soils, and rocks. However, despite the importance of their activities, they are unseen every day they already are unseen in everyday human experience so we have this you know i i have seen this on facebook no, some posts no. the algae says when you produce m almost as much oxygen as trees but nobody appreciates you this is true though so 
we only appreciate the importance of trees but actually a great proportion or a great amount of oxygen in the atmosphere are actually produced by algae and many of those are found in the marine environment okay we have been talking about the marine environment but let us uh, review first no, about the ocean habitats so that we know that the i know that you have already uh, tackle this one in your oceanography classes now so the world's oceans and seas we know that they form an interconnected water system now everything is connected movies that they only saw before nga basic mga isa sa Pilipinas gikan po like China we don't know because after all the oceans have no boundaries we know that fishes are capable of long uh, distance migration okay so the upper surface of the ocean is in constant motion that is because there is always wind you know, that pushes it creating the waves there is also deep water circulation systems you no know, because of the differences in pressure in temperature of the water that there is vertical uh, waves that is happening okay so if you remember your oceanography so between ocean basins now there is water circulation so that's basically that's uh, how we uh, describe the ocean habitats now one of the most important <coughs> sorry one of the most important uh, physical uh, physical parameter or physical parameter in the oceans this is the light and the temperature so light is of fundamental importance in the ecology of microorganisms that use light energy for photosynthesis although not all uh, microorganisms in the ocean are capable of photosynthesis and also in other functions thus affecting the primary productivity so i think you already know how to compute how to determine primary productivity so you can determine primary productivity by measuring chlorophyll a concentration right you uh you shave you know, the different photosynthetic photosynthetic microorganisms from the water then you extract you know, the chlorophyll and then you measure the absorbance so that's how then there is a computation that will make you determine the primary productivity of a particular uh, water body. Okay. So the extent to which light, light of different wavelengths you know, penetrates seawater depends on a number of factors. So cloud cover you know, would be one, the polar ice caps, dust in the atmosphere, and variation of the incident angle of solar radiation, no? and some other all these soft organic matters that are found in the marine and the, pelag the pelagic area that could hinder you know, the penetration of light into the deeper part of the ocean now microorganisms they occur in all the varied habitats that are found in the ocean so various ecological zones we know that you i know that they already know this that the ecological zones in the marine environment so where can you find you know, the marine or marine microorganisms so they could be members of the planktonic community okay so they may be free floating or just drifting within the water column okay so or they could be associated with suspended particles and colloidal materials or they could be attached to surfaces like rocks and other submerged structures or they could be associated with other marine organisms like plants animals and even bacteria and even other microorganisms or you can find them in the sediments no? so specifically you can find plankton no and marines no and epi and in the symbionts pelagic animals in the in this from the uh, epipelagic down to the deep sea trench you know, of the ocean from the 
uh, littoral with the coastal areas to the abyssal plain, uh, you will find different microorganisms. So microorganisms, you can find them everywhere. Even in the photic and in the aphotic zone, microorganisms are there. Even in the estuarine or in the uh, pelagic parts, uh, ano, then there are microorganisms. In there. So we've said that microorganisms could be members no, of the planktonic community. Now, how do we classify plankton? So they could be classified based on size. So by the way, I know that you already thought with this, but just to remind you, you don't say planktons, you say plankton, plural or singular. But if you want to emphasize plural, you can use the term plankters. Okay, in terms of the size classification, there are four categories. No? So uh, plankton could be a femtoplankton, picoplankton, nanoplankton, and microplankton. The viruses, you now with this size range, the marine viruses are considered femtoplankton. It is very difficult not to, uh, to, to sample from the environment. You really need specialized um, equipment for that. The bacteria, archaea, parasinophytes, sometimes and some flagellates. Now they are called picoplankton. But specifically, uh, bacteria could also be called bacterioplankton or fungi, the mycoplankton. Okay? Nanoplankton are those coccolithophores, the diatoms, the dinoflagellates, and the other flagellates. And microplankton are those ciliates. Now, some diatoms with this range, then the flagellates for an infera, and some yeasts. Now, the microorganisms are always are found in the marine environment. So, uh, what uh, composition, what is the composition of the seawater that is actually you know, able to support uh, microbial life. So seawater is slightly alkaline, so it's actually near neutral. It is an aqueous solution with a complex mixture of more than 80 solid elements, gases, and dissolved organic substances. So the major con these constituents of the seawater are sodium, the sulfate, magnesium, bicarbonate, calcium, potassium, and the largest are the chloride. Okay. So the, the salinity components now, of the seawater is just 34.4 uh, grams or pretty much 35 grams because in salinity that is 35 parts per thousand. Now if you measure the salinity, the seawater. Okay. So, mas dako gihapag kuan ang, ang water, pure water, kesa sa salt nga components. And it is salty because of these following salts na that make up the seawater. So, the biological pump na in the ocean na is very important because in the ocean, it is not just uh, the, the microbial or the microorganisms the play a very vital role now in the production in uh, production and recycling of nutrients okay so carbon dioxide is taken up you know, by the photosynthetic organisms these photosynthetic organisms are being eaten by the primary producers and then they produce their they they, 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 they die or they uh, defecate their fecal material so there will be dissolve organic matter contribution no, in the marine environment. Now this free dissolve organic matter in the form of polymeric macromolecules they can spontaneously assemble to form gels in surface waters that will coalesce to form larger aggregates that diffuse no, into the bulk seawater. These are now called microgels. Now, microgels can further coalesce into larger 
structures that are termed TP no, or transparent exopolymeric particles. And this TP is very important in the formation of marine snow. So what is marine snow? So marine snow is a continuous shower of clumps and strings of material that falls no, through the water column and this is termed marine snow because it resembles no, the falling snowflakes when illuminated underwater. So diba, when, in it, when it is at night and you you swim in the in the water and then you uh call any more flashlight, you walk any more flashlight, you will see this different like snow. No, 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 no. Those are marines, what we call marine snow. And this marine snow is an aggregate no, of not just dissolved organic matter but of plankton cells, no, detritus from dead or dying plankton, zooplankton fecal material, and some inorganic particles. And the one that's glued them together no, is the matrix no, called the TEP, which is also released by the plankton so this is an example of a marine snow okay now aside from marine snow microorganisms you know, are also capable of producing uh, biofilm okay so biofilm okay it consists of a collection of microbes it is bound to a solid surface by their extracellular products that traps organic and inorganic components. So in the marine environment, all kinds of surfaces including microorganisms, plants, animals, sediment particles, rocks, and fabricated structures may become colonized by biofilms. And not just that, the sea surface could also be covered by a gelatinous biofilm. So the interface between the sea surface and the atmosphere is the site of the exchange of gases, aerosols, and trace elements in both directions. So the SML, or the sea surface microlayer, which is typically 1 mm thick, has very different physical chemical parameters and microbial composition from those that underlying seawater. So this contains, the SML contains high concentrations of lipids, proteins, and polysaccharides, which much of it aggregated into GAPs that are formed mainly from phytoplankton. So the organisms that are associated with the surface layer are known as the neosperm. So you will know that already in your previous courses. So the physical properties of the sea surface are altered by the presence of the SML. Notice this gelatinous biofilm. So they will produce surfactants. The surfactants are compounds that lower the surface tension. So just like in oil spills, so surfactants are used so that the surface tension between the water and the oil you know, will be better so that it will be easier to remove the oil. So surfactants are like that. They modify the turbulence and the formation of bubbles and microwaves in the marine environment. So when you see gelatinous biofilm, when you see in a particular uh, in the horizon, in the you may you may see some more mga oil slicks and something like that. Those are called surface slicks. The surface slicks and may are called no the gelatinous vapor. It's not necessarily oily something. No, Naman siya oily yung pagkita nga. Asa ah, so ng mga oil? In, in, the, in, the, in the VSU beach, now we can see many of those. But uh, those are actually called no, biofilm, gelatinous vapor, which are aggregate again of different microorganisms, specifically or mostly the phytoplankton. Now, aside from that, they are, microorganisms are also found in the marine sediments, no, not just in the, in the water column, but also in the sediments. 
Now, more than 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by marine sediments. On the continental shelf, sediments are formed due to the accumulation of eroded materials that are transported to the ocean as particles of mud, sand, or gravel together with copious particulate organic matter, carbonate, and silica-rich compounds reduced by biological activity. So even in the sediment, now, there are so many microorganisms found in there. Now, they are not just found in the sediments or in the surface layer, in the pelagic zone, in the water column. They are also found coating in the different surfaces. So, th those are called biofilm, right? But there could be accumulation of this biofilm through time. Okay. And the, inside the biofilm, you know, the environment is very different from outside the, of the biofilm. These, they have different metabolic processes. You know, and the succession of these different microorganisms because of the alteration of the biofilm, the environment you know, that favors other types of microorganisms, could result in the development of multi-layered structures known as microbial mats okay so they could they could be of several millimeters to a few the centimeters thick depending on the nutrients and environmental conditions so mats they may contain multiple types of bacteria archaea proteas and fungi and also viruses in combination with microbial polymers or the TEPs and sedimentary materials these are particularly important in shallow and intertidal waters but they are also found you know, in deeper nutrient rich waters so this is an example of a layer you know, of microbial mats you know, found in different microbial marine habitats now aside from those there are also some uh, types or some places in the marine environment in the marine or in the ocean now that could also serve as special habitats you know, for these microorganisms they are not the conventional habitats that's why they're called the special habitats because they are not they are not found you no know, everywhere they are found just in certain areas example hydrothermal vents are the black smokers there are also many microorganisms now that are found in this habitat in cold seeps, cold seeps are not really cold. They are they are almost uh, they are almost of the same temperature with that of the water column. They are just uh, cold cold to in order to differentiate them from hydrothermal vents because hydrothermal vents they are actually uh, they, they actually uh, emit hot water. But cold seeps, almost the same activity as hydrothermal vents, but uh, the, the, the gases or the water that they emit are not hot. So they are called cold, but they are not really cold. They have almost the same temperature as, their, as the water column. Now, microorganisms could also be found in sea ice. So they could, they, they could be found trapped in between uh, in the spaces you know, in between the uh, water molecules because we, we know that when water freezes it becomes solid water it, it becomes ice and it forms a very uh, pattern there is a pattern of conformation so in, in spaces in the spaces you no know, in between those uh, water that has frozen then microorganisms could be trapped okay so there are also microorganisms that survives in underwater brine pools. No, so brine pools these are very salty, salty lakes. No, underwater. So they have different uh, salt composition to that of the water column. And lastly, microorganisms could also be found living on. No, it could be at the surface 
or in marine organisms. Okay? So you have here a seagrass, a seaweed, I'm sorry, and a coral. No? So with microbial symbionts. So microbial biofilms can also form on the surfaces of all kinds of animal, seaweeds, and coastal plants. They provide a highly nutritive environment through secretion or leaching of organic compounds. Now many microalgae such as the atoms and the flagellates and primnishophytes and proteins such as ciliates, they also harbor, harbor bacteria on their surfaces or as endosymbionts within their cells. Now the external surfaces and intestinal content of animals, no marine animals, also provide a wide variety of habitats to a wide diversity of microorganisms. Okay. Now, to review the co the co the concepts, you now that or to remember the key concepts of our lesson, not today. So you you must. Uh, answer this question during your review time. So, what are these questions? So, what is microbiology? What are microorganisms? What is marine microbiology? How do we classify and name microorganisms? What are the different microbial life? How, where can we find microbes in the marine environment? What are the roles of microbes in the marine environment? Okay, so those are your review questions. Okay, so that ends our lesson for today on the foundations of marine microbiology. If you have questions, feel free to contact me through my email or you can you can type in, you, you can key in your questions in our official group chat on the Facebook Messenger. So thank you very much and see you again on our next lesson.